All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let's begin this time with a word of prayer, and then we'll get into our teaching sessions. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for yet another beautiful day in our lives. We thank you for this opportunity to come and learn at your feet. We pray, Holy Spirit, that even as we learn about urban church planting and, and Lord, just ways in which we can go about planting new churches and ministries, pray, Holy Spirit, that you will lead us, you will guide our discussions, our learning, and help us to, Lord, uh, be available, to be ready to receive everything that you want to speak to us, O oh God. Be with us during these, these hours, O oh God. We come at each one of us into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, so last class we did uh, chapter 7. We looked at urban church planting and missions in Acts. And then we also did chapter 8. Uh, how do we get started in church planting? So we saw, um, you know, you, you build a core team and you try to develop on that, have a healthy relationship with a core team. And you prepare from a distance, meaning... Uh, so we talked about this. So, for example, we are planning to start a church in another city, uh, and you are in another city. You can always start planning from a distance, right? And now with uh, uh, you know with Google and uh, internet that's available, uh, we can just start from anywhere. And then, if you have to relocate to the site, you relocate and you know launch the the church or the ministry. And then, even as we do all of this. God is calling us to be responsible, right? So we need to be able to plan our finances personally, what we need as a family, and also uh, as a church plant, your needs uh, for the church plant itself. Now, uh, some things that we focused on was uh, don't come to a place where you're depending on people for money, especially in the initial stages. Many, many, many ministries have crumbled or churches have not gone past that preparation stage because they didn't prepare well. Many of them have given up and turned back and gone. And they've learned the hard way. So it's not wrong to take your time. It's not wrong to prepare financially. It's not a sign of lack of faith. It's a sign of wisdom. right? So uh, you prepare financially, prepare for your family, for the church plant, and then planning for uh, personal needs, planning for legal and administrative uh, matters, right? Again, we talked about that. Legal and administrative regulatory matters have a legal entity. Uh, I've shared a couple of examples where, you know, especially in a time that we are living in, there's going to be persecution. There's going to be troubles, There's especially uh, if you look at Christianity. So it's very important that we file all the legal requirements to start a church and then it's very simple as well it's not not a big uh you know it's not a big deal like what it was before it's very simple okay so these are some of the practical things that we may need to do now let's get into the survey phase right now we're going to see a sample survey of the bangalore city right uh now i don't have all of the details but if you look at it from 24, 20, 2010 onwards, we see a rise of the IT sector, right? Uh, uh, an incredible rise in the IT sector in the city of Bangalore. So we have people coming in from different parts of India, coming into Bangalore, and they've come here with one purpose, to work, to earn an income. It's a city uh, to have a better livelihood. You know, the strange thing is people from India go to other countries, right? We go to, you know, they choose other countries um, abroad. Why? For better living, better income, better facilities, all of that. So uh, there are people who move from different states into uh, the state of Karnataka or to Bangalore City. Now, the primary reason is because of the IT hub, right? Um, and you look at how the city has just developed over the years. Um, what what used to be outskirts is now no more outskirts. It's very close by, right? And uh, and we see that because of this, languages, cultures are all coming in 
right? So for example, in the early 2000s, I remember very well, you know, there were very few people who would speak in Hindi. Very few people, right? Uh, as far as I remember. But now we have so many people coming in from North India, from different parts, and they're speaking in Hindi. Hindi has become very common in our city, right? Now, there's some of, some of the culture of these uh, states are coming into our city. Some of, uh, some of the languages are coming in, which is good. Right? It gives us an opportunity because I know of many people who have, uh, you know, who have come from different states and they've come they've, because they're alone here. They're seeking for, you know, friendships, community. And they've come into church and they become believers. Some of them are around us who are in central, right? They're there. There's some of them in, our, in, in the APC East as well. Uh, I know of uh, maybe about three of them who have come from uh, North India. They came, they, you know, they got a job in uh, IDPL side, they got a hostel there, and somebody invited them. Right? They're staying in a, you know, the PGs there, and somebody invited them to church. They came to church, they continue to come to church, they become believers. Right? Now the challenge is, how do I tell my parents or how do I inform them? And uh, But they become believers, proper Bible-believing believers, right? So it's very important. We looked at it in chapter in the previous chapters as well. The survey phase is important because it helps us to understand who is our audience, who are we talking to, and what must we do to effectively communicate the gospel. Now let's go to Acts chapter 16, and we look at Paul and his team at Philippi, Acts 16. Now this is Paul's second missionary journey in Acts 16, and verses 11 through 15. So if anyone can please read that, Acts chapter 16, 11 through 15, Paul and his team, that is Paul, Silas, uh, and Timothy, they go together to Philippi, and even as they enter, uh, they take time to look around the city, try to find out what's happening here. So anyone can read, please. Acts 16, 11 through 15. Therefore, selling from Troas, we ran a straight coast to Samothrak, and the next day came to Nepolis, and from here to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the uh, riverside, where prayer was customary, customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman who made there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a sailor of purple from the city of Tait Taitira who worshipped God, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she began us saying, if you have judged me to, to faithful to, her, to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she constrained us. Yes, thank you. So we see here, now, Paul, Silas Timothy, they head on, they go into Philippi. Okay, verse 13 says, On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. So they, they were basically finding a place where, you know, maybe there are some believers or maybe there are some Jews who are getting together and praying. So what are they doing? They're doing a survey, meaning they're trying to find out what is the feel of this place, Philippi? Now, remember, this is the first time they're in there. It's new territory. It's new ground, right? So they go there and expecting to find a place of prayer, we sat down and began to speak to the women who had gathered there, right? So what do we see? We see these three. Normally, what would they do? In the first missionary journey, they followed the same thing. They went into Galatia. And they went into the synagogues, began to preach, began to share the gospel. Uh, and then people who are from other places also came in. They were able to minister to the Gentiles as well. Now, we just see the same thing here. Paul at Athens in Acts 17, and this is, uh, I think, very familiar to each one of us. In Athens, Acts 17 was 16 to 23.
Anyone can read that? Yes, go ahead. 17, uh, 16. Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore, he reasoned in the synagogue with, synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him. And some said, what does this babbler want to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Areopagus, saying, may we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak. For, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are very religious. For as I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar with, with this per inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. Yes, thank you. So again, we see something very similar, and we've already gone through this uh, many, many a times. But now Paul has finished, a, uh, finished Thessalonica. He's gone into Berea, and then he gets into Athens. So Paul comes alone to Athens. And what does he do? I like that. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see the city is full of idols. So what did he do? Right. So he reasoned with people in the synagogue and in the marketplace. Right. And he what did, it was 22. Then he stood up in the meeting of the Eropagus and said, men of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Why? Because I see that there are so many idols around in the city. I've walked around. I've seen. I walked around your streets. I've seen there are so many idols. And even one of your idols said to an unknown God. Now, what you say is unknown, let me make it known to you. Now, the point is not how he evangelizes or brings the gospel, which is another story altogether. But the point is he went about looking around, seeing or surveying the land of Athens, the place that he was in, in Athens. Right? He, he, what did he say? I see that you people are very religious. I see that you have idols around you. So let me bring the gospel to you. Right now, this is, this is very important. Selecting the launch area and identify the area in which you will be doing the church plant. Now, even as we go ahead in this, you know, some of you may feel, hey, I'm not called to be a, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to plant a church. Right? It's all right. I don't don't switch off. But what you can do is you apply these principles, even if it's a small ministry within the local church that you're serving in. Right? You can apply these things. Identify the area where, in which you will be doing the church plant. Look at Paul. He did that. From here, he goes on to uh, Corinth, and from Corinth, he goes on to Ephesus, Ephesus to Macedonia, and then uh, he just carries on his journey there. Right? And in every place, Paul surveyed the land. He took time. Remember to the, uh, uh, to the Cretes, he says, one of your own prophets have said this. Right? That means he did a survey. He tried to understand what are their belief system, the Cretes. Right? So once you identify the launch area or where you want to plant your church, you may be able to identify this area when you come on site, but often you can do an on site uh, survey to uh, see the city. Ask God to direct you to the place where you want to start. Very important. Now, we've been talking about the practical things that we need to do. Now, you've done all the practical stuff, right? Okay, you prayed, you said, God, okay, God is saying you start here, you do this, you do that. Okay, you've, you've also put down a date. 
maybe Jan 2027, I'm going to start my church. Right Now the time is coming closer. Ask God to direct you on how you want to do the launch. Where you want to do the launch, meaning who should who you should you know tag along with? Should I do it alone? Are there people that you're bringing? Remember that when you ask God for guidance, God brings people into your life. God brings opportunities into your life, right? So you ask God. The goal is to impact the city. Again, you have the bigger vision in your mind. I want to start a church. I want to have multiple locations. At first, the main church should grow. I should be able to stand on my own. Uh, as a church congregation, I should be able to go out, do missions together as a church, start a Bible college, do these conferences, do these events. And then eventually, I also want to start uh, raise up many leaders who can start new places, new churches in different locations. Now, this is a plan that you have put in. This is all part of the launching plan, right? You've done the survey already. Be sensitive to what God is doing in that city. Right, uh, pick an area where the church, where there is no church already. Now, don't go to an area, okay, where there are ten thousand people in the church, or there's, for example, there are five thousand people in the church. Don't go and start behind that a church. This is common sense. You don't need the anointing of the Holy Spirit to, because if you start one behind that church, or maybe two, three lanes behind. You've got a 5,000 member church and you've got a small, like you're just launching. After two years, five years, 10 years, you're seeing there are no people coming in. It's not God's fault. Maybe there are very few people coming, but it's not God's fault. Why? Because we've not prepared well enough. Here's the thing God tells us what to do, but we also have to put our mind into work there. Right? So, Think about what you're doing. It's okay to go away and do something new than to do something which is right next to, you know. Of that, if that church doesn't grow, for example, you started off and that church which you have started is close to a you know a bigger church, maybe 2,000, 5,000 member church. If it doesn't grow, the simple reason is because everyone preferred to go to the bigger church. Now, of course, there are people who prefer smaller communities, right? But the thing is, most of them, 9 out of 10, will want to go to the other church, right? Now, again, it's not competition. And very importantly, you don't want people from that church to come to your church, right? So you've got to think, right? okay, if there's a church here, let me go at least 5 kilometers away, right? Or seven kilometers away. Let me go away and start a church. You see, that's the best part about cities, right? Uh, I don't know how it is in villages and towns, but in cities, if a church is far away and people are connected to that church, people will come. Really, I'm saying, right? people will come. In 2022, somewhere in the month of August, there was a young couple that came from another state. They came into Bangalore and we were having, and they were working in, you know, I, IDPL side, Whitefield, east of Bangalore. So they had a house there, everything. And so they got, they came to church. And a couple of Sundays into that, they really connected with people in the church. Right now, they've been coming for many weeks. I would just say hi to them, pray with them. But I didn't realize that they built such a strong community with some of them in the church, they started attending life groups and I was very pleased, good, you know, young, because they don't know anybody in Bangalore, just the two of them, they're here. Now what happened is they have moved towards Yelanka, further on Yelanka, that's north of Bangalore. They have bought a place and they've moved there. And to my surprise, they come all the way to East, which is, I don't know, about 25 kilometers to 30 kilometers away. So I told them, hey, is APC North can go there. But they said, no, but we have all the people that we know here. It's not about the preacher. It's not about the location. It's about the people, the community that they have made. And so they come, they drive all the way till there. 
right? So especially in city, you'll find this happening. If you are able to build a community in your church, people will come, right? Uh, people will travel. It's okay. It's not a big deal, right? So don't be afraid to move away from existing churches, right? Meet with the pastors and leaders of existing churches and church organizations. Um, introduce yourself, build friendships, let them know your plan. Also see, uh, uh, you know, uh, dispel any fear of competition and sheep stealing that they may have. Very, very important, right? Now, in a city like Bangalore, there are many churches, right? Now, for example, you go a little away on the outskirts of Bangalore, you may have a church and you plan to start another church, which is five kilometers away. Go and meet that pastor. Say, pastor, see, uh, you know, introduce yourself, say, this is what I, I am. This is what I want to do. I want to start a church. Uh, I want to start, it's going to be an English church. This is my vision. Uh, this is my heart for this part of the city. I know that you have a church here, uh, but I'm assuring you that uh, you know, I'm not coming to sheep steal or I'm not coming to cause any strife or competition among us. Uh, we can actually, after some time, we can work together and do the ministry together. Now, what is happening? You're already being very open to the pastor. Open to me, telling him, I'm coming here for ministry. I'm not coming here to, you know, take people from your church or, uh, but I'm coming here to build God's kingdom and I'm, I'm willing to also work together with you in the future, right? So you're building trust, you're building relationships. Very important, right? Now, again, the, in this situation, there will be times when pastors may say, okay, that's good. Or sometimes they may say, uh, they may not be too happy. Remember that you cannot control what people react to, right? You say what you have to say. If they agree, good. If they don't agree, it's okay. What is more important? the ministry that God has given you or pleasing people. Right. So there will be times people may not agree to what you're doing. They may say, you know, you can't start here, all of that. Just end it peacefully. But you do what God has called you to do. As much as possible, try to build relationships, right? Then in your survey, your survey your launch area, understand your launch area, um, uh, uh, for a reasonable distance from your launch area, identify points of interest, schools, colleges, coffee shops, NGOs, places where youth hang out, or places where families get together, uh, places where you can evangelize, places where you can you know, meet with people, believers especially. Right? Uh, one of the things that I noticed is, I don't know if this is happening now, but many years ago, I, I was speaking to one of the pastors and uh, He's from North India, and he was sharing with me how he was able to minister to people. What he does is, he would wake up in the morning, drop his children to school, and then go to a park. And in that park, there used to be many families walking around. Right. So over time, he made friends. I know it's a long, tedious process, uh, but he made friends. He was able to communicate with people, and. Um, and then he would, you know, slowly evangelize, get people to, uh, you know, come for their meetings and all of it. And so many lives were touched and transformed that way. All he did was went and sat in the park. Now I'm not saying that you have to do that always. This is one of the ways that you can, right? Um, understand how you can, how to evangelize, where to evangelize. Now here's the important part: as you do all of this, don't Look at reading the Bible and praying, the, the personal disciplines. Don't go back on that. Don't say, okay, since I'm doing ministry, you know, going out, doing all of these stuff, survey phase, looking at places to launch, that is part of the ministry. What is the main ministry? People will follow because of the anointing, not because there's AC in the church. Right? Not because the worship, the band is very good. Maybe some of them will follow, but they follow, follow you for the anointing that God has placed in your life. right? So don't compromise on reading of the word and prayer, your personal time. right? That, is, that should be a routine. 
And out of that should flow everything else. Right? God can tell you, you know, you do this, you do this, go speak to this person. Or during the launch phase, he'll give you ideas. You know, you, you plan this, right? Uh, you do this kind of event, do this kind of conference. He will give you ideas, right? But that should flow out of your personal time with God. Okay? So let's go into the, now you've done the survey. Let's go into preparation phase, right? Now, so we're going to look at each phase and spend time on these phases, right? The preparation phase will always happen on site. You cannot prepare off site. You can't be in Bangalore and say, I'm going to start a uh, church in Mumbai or another city and say, okay, the prepare, I'm prepare, you know, the uh, launching meetings there. And you, you can't do it online. Don't try it. There's a time and a place for doing it via Zoom and online. You have to be on site. You have to get a feel of what's happening there. People must see you. You are the leader. You are launching the ministry. You must be there to effectively communicate what you want to see in the church, communicate the vision. You must be there. right? Now, how do we do this? You can have pre-launch meetings. Now, many, many ways. You can have this either at a home. You can hire a place. You know, for example, uh, APC Mangalore. Right. Now, initially, it was called APC Deralakate, which was, uh, did you all go there? You all went there, right? To the, so initially, the church was there, that side of uh, Mangalore. Right? How did it start off? Uh, you know, uh, there was an opening. And so pastor and another person, another believer with pastor's friend, they all went. They did a concert, Christmas concert. What was the Christmas concert? Two of them. Pastor was preaching. He was playing the guitar. There is a Christmas concert. But they did some evangelism and all. Now, if you think of it, imagine in 2002 going to Deralakate, because already it's a lonely area. But 2002, when they did this concert, one or two people liked what happened. They said, so then, they, so then that same hall which they hired said, we are going to meet from next Sunday onwards at the same hall. Now, a few people came church was planted. Same thing happened in Athens. Remember, if, if, if you look at uh, uh, Acts 17, go towards the end. Go towards the end. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered, but others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. At that, Paul left the council. Look at verse 34. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Now, does it say thousands believed? Few men became followers of Paul and they believed in the message that Paul spoke. Same thing. They did a small concert. Now, this is one way of doing it. Or what you can also do is you can say, for example, APC as a church, right? They, they did some outreaches. Right, they give out tracks, all of it, and they said, "Okay, February eighteenth, two thousand and one. We are meeting as a church. This is the place." So he had also, you know, posted those tracks, and you, during those days, you can post it, right? So he had a whole mailing list. So he posted all the tra tracks. It was in the house. Right? First Sunday, eight people came, eight or twelve people. People came. They had the church service in the house. That was a launch. First Sunday. Right? Now, nothing very big. Nothing very fancy. Just did a little bit of outreach. Posted these invites. Few of them came. One of them was surprisingly, you see this, surprisingly, it was, you know, pastor's college friend. School and college friend. Who came. Said, we got this in the uh, post, and they came to the house, attended the first service. And they became an integral part of APC, especially in the uh, initial phase, because he was like a worship leader. He knew how to play the guitar and lead worship and all of it. So God will bring the people. There was nothing fancy. There was nothing big about it. Simple, 
starting small, right? So these pre-launch meetings can either happen over a period of three months, six months, or it could even be just a month. Right? So for example, you, you launch a church, you have a house fellowship, right? First Sunday, 10 people come. Next Sunday, it becomes 15 people. Now you know, in the house, I can't continue. Now you know why it's important to prepare financially. Imagine you have 15 people in the house. You can't stop church growth. So for example, you start a church, right? 10 people have come. One of them will say, hey, I have, uh, I'm from a hostel. I'll bring some uh, five, six people. Can you say, don't bring? Yeah, yeah, bring everyone and come. But you know that this place only fits 15 people in the house. And eventually, you need a place. Now imagine you're, you, you, people are willing to come, but as a leader, I'm not prepared. Oh, man, what to do? God, I need a place. I don't have the finances. I don't have the people. I don't have, I, what do I do? Now, that that's calls for lack of planning. But if I have enough funds in my account, I'll say, okay, how many people you want to call? You, uh, I want to call five, five of my friends. So the next Sunday, if they come, you see, okay, there is 15, 20 people. Take a decision. Say, God, should I step out? Should I find a place? God says, yes, go ahead with it. And each of these decisions, you'll find peace. Right? God will bring the people also. Right? And so, you know, you, you go find a place, get the place. And start off. And this is where you need to have the the money to buy speakers, at least the basic things. See, gone are those days when um, you know uh, we don't have speakers. You know, you could just stand and you know preach. Now, the basic need is speakers, maybe one projector. Right? It's not not too much to ask for. So, if you have the funds with you, you can just go ahead. So, what's happening? There's no stop. You have planned, you have prepared it before itself. You see the importance there? Now, this picture, you didn't have the money. What you will do? What would you do? So you have 15 people. And in those 15 people, some of them come to you and say, Pastor, no, I think we have people, youth are coming. The, you are a youth, so people want to come and listen to yourself. What do we do? Let's pray for funds. It's not the time to pray for funds. It's the time to be prepared. You know, what will you do? Can't do anything. You'll have to be there itself. Right? Or you'll have to ask people, which which I wouldn't do. Right? So we need to be prepared. You see the importance of being financially prepared? Right? So you in your pre-launch phase, it can you know the house meetings, you can either continue it on for two or three months. If people have not increased too many, now don't have 30 people in your house and then, you know, in a house and banging the drums and the guitar and all of it. No, we don't want to cause a nuisance. Right? We need to be wise there as well, right? So officially, you have to move to a place, do the church plant, right? There may be times when, uh, you know, you'll have to do one on one evangelism, evangelism, you'll have to uh, build your core team. Uh, spend time in prayer, all of this will be there. Right? But as much as possible, try to, right, uh, especially when this pre launch time, uh, be prepared. So, for example, let me share this. When I went to Mangalore in 2018, right, we were about 10 people. Then we began to grow, and uh, there were many students coming from Derlakate, which was far away. Now, there was no church there. So I was just waiting, right? I saw, okay, 25, 30, 30 students are coming. But over time, what happened was they were not coming every Sunday. So I got them all together, and especially the main guys. I got them, the youth leaders. I said, what is the reason that you're not able to come every Sunday? So they all gave me the reasons. They said, some of them said, see, we're very tired Monday to Saturday. Genuine, right? because they wake up early morning. They have a tough you know, Monday to stuff schedule, classes or general. Two is on Sundays, the bus facilities, you know, normally on weekdays, they have about 15, 20 buses going up and down. But on Sundays, there are only two or three buses. 
So for them to reach all the way to the city, they have to catch sometimes three buses or they have to leave very early. So they said it's a little hard. Okay. Three years, they said, Sunday morning, we want to sleep. Other days, we don't get to sleep. It's genuine, right? So I said, okay. So I said, if we start an evening service, see, one is you want to sleep. Sleep, Sunday, no problem. Two is, if we start an evening service there, do you think you can come? He said, yeah, we can. Now, then I said, see, if it's evening service, it's going to be 5 to 7, somewhere around there. Do you think Sunday evening you won't have any work? No, no, no work. We can come. And if it's somewhere close by, I think many people can join us. I said, OK. Then I said, uh, so I asked them, what, what are the other concerns that you What about the word, preaching of the word, worship? Are you OK with all of that? They said, yes, we like it. We like uh, everything that's happening here. I said, OK. So I said, give me time. Right. Uh, then I also said, okay, what if I, what if we, you know, we, we, I was discussing with Pastor and I, so what if we arrange a vehicle, you know, one of these uh, tempo travelers, these vehicles, uh, you know, 20, 30 seater, they come, pick you up, drop you to the church, finish, and then go back and drop you back. And they said, see, that's a possibility, but they have to get up in the morning again. No. So now if you send the TT, and 10 of them say, no, I'm not coming to church. TT is already there, but only 10 people coming. This is a 30-seater TT. So then it's a, it's a waste, right? And we can't force everyone. You have to come because TT has come. No. Genuine reasons like they're not well or they're tired, that's OK. So then after about three or four months of thinking and waiting and waiting on the Lord, I felt in my heart. It's time that we can start that. So immediately I spoke to Pastor and I said, See, Pastor, this is what it is. And I gave him all the reasons. One, two, three. These are the reasons. This, this is what's happening. And these are all believers. Many of them are believers, right? Proper believers. But they don't have a church to go to. Secondly, there is no church in their like a day. So it's not like we are going and doing some competition there. So I put down everything. Pastor said, Go ahead. Now I've got the thing, right? Permission. So now we have to find a place. So I said, before that, before finding a place, let's start evening meeting. Meaning, let me see how many people will come if we have like a house in, in their, you know, in and around their hostel. So we asked for permission to just use one of the hostel rooms. Can we do that? So they said, okay. Now I wanted to see. Whether they'll keep their word. It's not like I don't have faith in them, but I wanted to see because I don't want to start something and then you know cause a problem later on. Right? Like nobody came. You because of you, I started the church, you didn't come. Sounds so bad. So then I said, okay, two months we did this. Many people were coming. Regularly they were coming. I said, okay, let's look for a place. Now looking for the place, all of that was I had to do, right? Uh, during those days we had very few volunteers, plus the volunteers were all working and college so so i'll go i'll search for places write down for if there's any for lease or for rent i will write down that number come back home call uh and i had certain criteria in mind i don't want somewhere inside i want on the main road one i want walking distance from the college two and i don't want the students to catch a bus and all of that it should all, it should all just be walking distance so i had these things in mind by the grace of God, God led me to a right place, right where it was. You know, the colleges, colleges in front, and we got a place right opposite. And this person, uh, you know, he who the owner of this place, he he was a Muslim man, but he the moment I said it's for church, he became very happy. He said, "I want to give it to you at a less cost." Because this is a blessing if you're using for a church. It's for God's work. I said, thank you. And he said, then I then I said, see, there's only one toilet where you have to go out, use the toilet and come. There will be girls coming, uh, young girls coming. So we need a restroom inside. Don't worry, I'll build it for you. So he built a restroom inside. Right? And everything was done for us. 
we started off, we had a worship evening on a Saturday evening. We informed the main church also, Saturday evening, worship evening. We gave out invites. We did everything that we had to do. So many new people came and our regular folks also came. That worship evening, I remember we were about 110 odd people because our main church people came, uh, the, the youth also came. We did a worship evening. That day I announced, tomorrow onwards, we have a church here, 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. And this will start from the coming Sunday. And so we started. I didn't have to do anything in terms of, uh, you know, somebody volunteer to set up the mics, uh, set up the sound system or uh, ushering. Everything was already set because these these youth, these 25, 30 youth who are coming to, them, to the main church, they knew everything. So they did everything here. And the church was, you know, very beautifully launched in that place. Right now, I know it's not easy. It's easy to say, uh, you know, Thankfully, God has blessed us as a church, and we were able to, you know, take the place for leads. But remember that if we plan and prepare well, we also can do it this way. Right? No, no, no. Everything was on paper. I, I also wrote in the agreement. I made sure I said this is a church. This is the timings. Apart from Sunday, we will also meet for other days like prayer, Wednesday prayer or Thursday prayer. We assure you that we will not be making. Uh, the decibel levels of this, everything I put. So we will not be disturbing anyone. We also assure you that we are not forcing people to become Christians. This is a church, it's open, people can come. Right? We are not going into colleges and telling them if they want, they can come. So everything I put on the agreement, everything, so that there is nothing against us. Right? And now I, the Lakota is doing really well. The church is also growing beautifully. So. When you pre-launch, don't be in a hurry. Take time, is what I'm trying to say, right? Uh, sp spend time in worship, prayer, intercession. Know your primary target audience and others. Now, your primary target audience can vary, right? So, for example, you're a young man, and you start a young man or young woman, you start a church. You know that, you know, normally, youth will get attracted to youth. Right, so many youth will come. Then there'll come a phase where you get married, you have children. Suddenly, you'll have families coming in, right? So then you have to balance. Okay, you're in this age of youth, and you're in this age of family. Sometimes I feel that's where I am, right? So where I have these families, they come and share with me. Then I have to also look at youth, right? Okay, uh, so I minister to them as well. So I, you need to maintain that balance, but there will be a. Uh, you know, you you have that as your primary audience, right? It could be even uh, okay, English speaking, right? So, for example, right now at APC East, my primary focus is to get into those IT hubs. It's right there, ten minutes away, and PGs, paying guests, hostels. In each place, you have about five hundred people, youth living. And that place is filled with hostels and paying guests. So how do I get involved? Give me an opportunity. One door. Right? And there are many of our church folks, youth who come from hostels, they're saying, they've shared with me, they're saying, Pastor, we have more than 500, 600 people in our PG. How do we get in? How do we minister? Them? Now, that's a, that's a focus area now. right? That's a target that we can do. We have a lot of families, but we also want to focus on youth. right? So know your primary audience. Identify ways to connect with your target audience. Uh, just as Jesus sent his disciples to minister to the Jewish people, you also you find that audience, you go and minister. Uh, then identify people who God has already prepared. So uh, you see here in Acts 16, God had prepared Lydia, Lydia's heart, right? And it says that uh, Lydia said, her heart was changed. She heard the gospel from the Apostle Paul, and she said, come and stay in my place, and she was able to serve uh, serve the people. So there will be people who their hearts are ready. God will prepare them, right? But also remember, discern what you're doing. Discern and avoid people with wrong intentions and wrong motivations. Sometimes people will want to 
come near you, be with you always, because they want something out of you. Remember Gehazi and Elisha? Gehazi was always with Elisha. He was, but his heart was not in the right place. But look at Elijah and Elisha. His heart was in the right place, Elisha. Gehazi messed up. There are sometimes people who will want to be with you for wrong reasons. So you need to discern. I'm not saying you push them away, but learn how to, you, you keep your focus. So no, this is what I'll do. Whether he comes and he or she comes and says this, doesn't say this, whatever they say, Lord, I'm going to hear from you. I'm going to listen to you. So you're not easily making decisions by, uh, by what people are saying. Right? Then you, after you identify your launch location, uh, ensure that the location is easily accessible. Very important. That's why I didn't want to see something which is interior. Remember, I didn't want people to walk two, three kilometers. No, they are, they are youth. I mean, they don't want, want to catch a bus and all that and come. So I was trying to make it as easy, accessible for them. Ensure the meeting place is clean and suitable. Uh, ensure basic facilities are available. Parking, restroom. Remember. I said, see, I didn't want the girls to go out and everyone watching the girls going using that common restroom, which was, you know, guys is okay. But girls, it's, uh, and these are college girls, young girls. So I didn't want that to happen. So I said, we need one inside. It's a simple thing. Right? It's not like, okay, church, start church. Right? It's a simple thing, right? Uh, you just got to think about these things. Uh, then you can start, uh, you could start at home, move into an auditorium later on. There is no set formula. Make a note of that. There is no set formula. If you want, you can take a haul now and start now itself. Nothing wrong in that. Right? Your launch phase, you can, you can, if you want, you can say, okay, December, first Sunday is my first Sunday as a church. You can take up a 100-seater hall and start off. No problem. But make sure you prepared yourself for that. Nothing wrong in this launch. It's not necessary that you have to start in your house, then after house you move into a small hall, and then you buy. Not necessary. Nowadays, you can just buy your music system, set it up, uh, buy a couple of guitars, buy a guitar, keyboard, everything, keep it. Whether people are there to play or no, that's secondary. Buy everything, got the hall, you say, okay, church from next Sunday. Right. You do your outreach, all of it. So it's not necessary. You have to have a house for it. This is just something that was followed in the book of Acts. But remember, we adapt over time. The, we are in 2024. We adapt. right? Uh, and so you could start from anywhere. If you're renting, make it absolutely clear that you're using the place for church. Make sure that the gathering uh, and the worship of and, and worship and all the activities happening does not become a troublesome thing to the neighbors. That is why we suggest you know, when you become bigger as a church, small, uh, you know, when you launch in a house, as soon as possible, move out, find a bigger space. Because it shouldn't be a trouble. Don't say this is God's work. God will look after that. No. God is giving us the wisdom. We are living in a society. We must. But they play loud music you know, for their festival. That is they. You are different. You do things the right way. If somebody else jumps into a pit, you won't go and jump in because he jumped in. Right? We need to think. OK, so I want to do it the right way. So quickly, just the five principles. We need to live in a community. We need to learn the community. We need to link gospel ministry to the community. We need to love the community. We need to launch in the community. Right. Everything happens within the community. Nothing happens outside of the community. It happens in the people. That is what it is. Right? Okay, let's take a break and then we'll come back and we'll pick up from where we stopped.